right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeline or CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined by Greg Nutter, who's probably in a slightly sunnier San Diego because he's further south than I am. How are you doing, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> Doing well. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, you should be, you'd be surprised that uh, the you know five ten miles can make a a degree or two difference in heat. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, Greg is management consultant where he helps business owners and senior sales executives solve revenue growth problems through direct, indirect, and multi-channel sales models. Author of the Amazon best-selling book P three Selling: The Essentials of B two B Sales Success. And what we're going to talk today about is something very fascinating. And that is the top five, uh, the top five mistakes B2B sellers make. And uh, so um, listen in and see, hopefully you'll go through these five and go, no, nah, I don't do any of those. Or maybe you'll be the opportunity to go, oops, I do all of those. Either way, it'll be a good education experience. So Greg, let's get straight into it. What's the number, what, let's start at the back, right? What's the, what's the fifth, number five on the list of mistakes that uh, B2B sellers make? Well, I'm going to start off with one of the biggest ones. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go against the grain. But the first one I think of that I see all the time is forgetting what selling is. You know, so if you ask people what selling is, they'll tell you, well, it's getting people to buy my stuff. But if you ask them what behaviors, you get a whole lot of different um, ideas and thoughts and perspectives. Um, a lot of people think selling is um, giving information and then asking for the order. And we see that quite a bit all the time. But real selling, in fact, that I call that clerking, mm -hmm. real selling is about creating awareness, getting someone to say, ah, you know, you're right. This problem is I, I really should do something about it. Or getting somebody to say, you know, you're, you're right. Uh, I should consider... Um, the factor that you just raised as a really important decision criteria mm -hmm. or you know what um we should have bill involved in this decision so it's creating awareness uh for people to change their perspectives and their ideas and sales so i see that as kind of the right. uh one, one of the top ones forgetting what selling is thinking it's clerking but in reality it's all about creating awareness yeah and and i feel like that that has become I mean, it was always prevalent, but I think in some ways it's become more prevalent because of, you know, all this stuff with inbound and this and that is where salespeople, I think a lot of salespeople uh, started to get a little bit too comfortable and maybe think that things landed on their plate. So they did become uh, maybe demo people, demo mm. and orders, right? Instead of, as you said, instead of really getting in and developing needs, because as you know, from your background, I mean, you could have a you could have a conversation with me, and I could mention something that sounds like an an issue I have. You could jump on it immediately, and it turns out that it's an issue I don't care about, and right. you just a ton of time. Yep, yep, absolutely. Which kind of leads me to the second one, and and I've seen a lot of this uh, on a day to day basis. I'm sure uh, you do as well, John. Is is how poorly people do prospecting. Mm. They lead with product and company and features instead of leading with problems. You know, companies don't buy products, they don't buy services. They buy solutions to problems mm -hmm. and ways to capture opportunities. And if you look at the people who are trying to sell you stuff day in, day out, how many of them talk about product and how great their product is and how the analysts say it's wonderful and how great their company is? You know, I like to say without the context of a problem or an opportunity, a product features makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I, I would go a step further, and I, I would say that I think people have, a lot of people have lost the art of prospecting, uh, even, even, and and have become prospecting averse, if you like. And again, I mean, some of this is because of all the focus on inbound and all of that that people stopped prospecting but i don't think a lot of people know how to prospect effectively today they still think it's just oh i just get a bunch of numbers send out a bunch of emails or whatever mm. yeah look at that nothing happened nothing came back shows you cold prospecting is dead right well the way most people do cold prospecting doesn't work so yeah. i can see why a lot of reps give up uh i think i 
I, I read some stats not long ago that said, you know, it takes about on average about eight touch points uh, to get uh, to reach a prospect, yeah. get them to respond. Uh, but the average rep makes two. Mm -hmm. So before they move on and say, hey, this is worthless. So with that kind of a hit rate, and particularly when you're pitching product and, and your services and your features and how good you are, no wonder, no wonder reps think it's a, it's a waste of time. But done well uh, with a very compelling message that's very targeted to the right audience with the right number of touch points, um, it, can, it can work. It absolutely can work. Yeah. And I think the other thing is... Um is you kind of got to embrace it, right? You kind of got to embrace it instead of seeing it as a necessary evil because you'll never do your, you'll never put your best foot forward if you're doing something that you just kind of have to do, but you hate doing. You got to find some way of, 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 ma of connecting with it and making it something that's uh, at least somewhat enjoyable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about the third one that uh, I'm sure we all see all the time. And um, I get a lot of arguments over this one. Uh, I've run a lot of training sessions, and of course, you get some senior people who will argue with me. But the question is, thinking is that your role as a salesperson is to be either um, the relationship manager or the expert on your product. Now, the relationship manager, I get a lot of pushback from because I get people to say, well, people buy from people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, but... <laughs> In a B2B sale, um, people won't buy from you if they don't like you, clearly. Um, but being a likable person only goes so far. So the preferred role that a seller should play in a B2B sale should be an expert on the buying process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you notice I said the buying process and not the selling process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, their job is not to be the product expert, not to be the nice guy that takes them for drinks, but to someone to be a guide on how to make that decision, who should mm -hmm. be involved, what problems get solved, what criteria should be used, what's the best information sources, right? Because companies are struggling with buying just as much as sellers are struggling with selling. Yeah, and so I if you've got a sales rep who can help guide that process, they're much more valuable than someone will take them for drinks at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I think that's such an, an incredibly important point, uh, Greg, is, is that uh, buying process. And I don't think enough companies spend enough time talking to the, talking even to customers that they have and asking them about their buying process and trying to figure out, because buying processes are dynamic, just like sales processes should be dynamic should be looking at them all the time to revise them and tweak them. And as you said, I do think today people are struggling with buying because they're bombarded with tools and services and this and that. And, uh, and, and they don't know often how to, I mean, well, I could see, say myself when we go to do things, sometimes you don't know quite how to evaluate what you're trying to, to get, you know, the need is, but you don't quite know how to evaluate the, the vendors. Yeah, um, there's been a number of research uh, published, a number of uh, research uh, articles published recently that talk about how companies struggle with their buying processes. Um, they're getting longer. There are more people involved. Um, and it's all a result of, I guess, companies becoming more risk adverse. Um, so we want to have, you know, I think 10 years ago, uh, an average B2B uh, sale included maybe five people. Yeah. Um, Five years ago, it was seven or eight. These days, it's 10 to 15. And, and that includes mm -hmm. companies that are, you know, 50 million people in size. Yep. Um, so they take longer. People are more worried. And if sellers can help um, make that easier, make it faster, uh, make it less stressful, um, they find um, there's less buyer remorse afterwards. Um, companies are much happier with the sale. So that's a key skill and a key role that a lot of sellers miss. They focus yeah. on being the product expert or the nice guy. Yeah. I think the other thing that sometimes um, people forget about is is also um, not just that there's a ton of people involved now, but each of those people have a different, have, have their own agenda is fine. And we know that you've got to figure that out. 
but they also have their own emotions too, right? So the right. point person, there's a lot riding on them, um, especially if they become the face of that product or service within their company. So I think that's the other thing sometimes we miss is saying like, making B2B buying decisions can be career enhancing, can also be career limiting. There's a lot of, and, and especially when we come into recessionary times, what do most companies do? They go, nah, I can live with it, live with it, live with it. Yeah. You know, so no decision is going to be winning a lot of the times. And especially if you don't understand the the buying process, or you can't, if you can't, um, if you like guide them through it, the chances are they're just probably not going to make any decision. Yeah. Yeah. I, I reminds me of a story way back in my Xerox days. Um, I was on the uh, printing system side. So mm -hmm. we sold, you know, um, uh, printers and software that if they broke, um, you could put a company out of business because you couldn't print checks or you couldn't pay people, those kinds of things, or insurance companies. And um, I always marvel by the other side of the house that people are well familiar with, like the, the copier side. And you would have people who weren't much more senior than a you know secretary or junior administrator making million dollar copier decisions. And when I'd come in and sell a fifty thousand dollar printer with a bit of software, that decision would go right up to the president, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was risk involved. Yes, and it's that four letter word. And today we're seeing many more. And you hit you know the uh, nail on the head there, but you know recession or almost any times. Um, people can absolutely lose their jobs by making poor buying decisions. And that's why they want lots of steps, lots of people involved because um, yeah. it's risky. Yeah. And and remember, they, yeah, and sometimes they're involving additional people to just cover their own bases, right? It's not even that that person really even needs to be involved. It's just like, you know, because sometimes you see a list of people from meeting, you're like, wow, who's this person, this person? And then they don't do anything or say anything. So they may contribute in the background, but it may be what you're talking about. It may be somebody just going that are involved them just in case. Yep, absolutely. Um, so the fourth one um, is to focus on the selling process versus the buying process. And CRM systems are mm -hmm. kind of, the way they're set up are one of the biggest reasons this happens. So what I mean by that is if you look, you know, uh, standard CRM system and what it looks like, how it's laid out. It starts with prospecting and then it goes uh, maybe uh, initial investigation call and then it'll go, uh, I don't know, demo uh, and then it'll go proposal uh, and close or something like that, right? Standard four or five stages in yeah. Salesforce. The problem is this, just because a seller has given a company a proposal, doesn't mean that that company is just about to make a decision. Mm -hmm. In fact, they may not have decided at all to make any kind of decision. And so what's important is not what the sales rep's doing. What's important is what the customer is doing or prospect yeah. is doing. Have they agreed to um, hear a little bit more about solving a potential problem early stage? Have mm -hmm. they started looking at information gathering information about potential solutions, ah, information search stage. Um, are they starting to develop criteria to compare the different uh, organizations, evaluate all the uh, alternative stage? Have they selected somebody and now they're looking at funding in the final stages? So the problem is this, is that um, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time either makes you look silly or can torpedo a deal. Yeah, And so it's important to watch what is the customer holistically doing and then aligning the seller's behaviors, mm -hmm. activities, so that they're in sync. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that's a really important, a really, really, another really important one. Uh, we used to call it back in the Hotway days, you know, the advanced versus the continuation. And it's, and it's amazing what a simple concept it is, but how a lot of people go, oh, I never thought of it like that. And it's like, I used to give the typical example of the, the you know, your rep comes back from a meeting and you say, how did it go? Great. Uh, <laughs> you know, we discussed that there's a real need there and you go, okay, well, what's the next step? He goes, well, he's agreed uh, to meet me again, you know, two weeks time, we're going to have lunch. And you go, okay, fantastic. 
what's he doing in the meantime? Right. We we have it we have it on the calendar. I say, okay, so basically you're buying two lunches in a row is what I'm hearing here. Because he's not doing anything. You haven't asked him to do anything. Therefore, between now and you know, your lunch next week, you're not even you're not you're not even top of mind. There's nothing he's doing. So that's just a continuation. That's not an advance. Yeah, absolutely. I, I use this analogy in my book um, of dancing, right? <laughs> and and that and and someone is dancing with you, engaged in the selling process. If they're doing something tangible to move the deal forward, mm-hmm. if you're doing all the work, I'm writing the proposal, I'm doing the follow up, I'm mm-hmm. getting to some pricing, I'm doing all the work, and you're not doing anything, then you're not dancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, no, exactly, exactly. And I, I even suggest, uh, here, I mean, here's how you get rid of uh, deals in your pipeline where nobody's dancing is you have a look at when was the last time this person did something that you could identify as their action to move the deal forward. Mm-hmm. And if it's been, depends on on your uh, how long your sales cycle is, but if 30, 60 days, something like that, then it's not a deal. Get it out of the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. And don't fall for those, uh, you know, when they say, oh, when you reach out and then they just go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's still it's still important. We're still discussing it. You know, call me back. You know, we'll connect with you in a week or two. That's just a polite way of saying no. Right. <laughs> or, I mean, I wish people would say no and just say no because it would be so much better for salespeople if people just said what they meant. But but it's great. It's to your point. Is yeah. If you look at if you look at the fact that they haven't done anything and there's you know and and all they've done is maybe maybe you've got a kind of a, a short reply to an email and you're all thrilled. Great, I'm in contact with them but they're still not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. You remind me of another situation. Um, uh, Again, back when I was in Xerox, um, Mm -hmm. certainly we had what we called the commercial team and they were kind of going to strip malls and, uh, you know, uh, business malls and door to door and, you know, trying to sell copiers. Mm -hmm. Now, the nice thing about that, which the sales reps wouldn't necessarily agree with, but if, if they didn't have a need and you kept talking, they would physically throw you out, <laughs> right? They didn't put up with it. They just threw you out. So you got a clear message that there's no deal here. Mm-hmm. But when you go into selling to big companies, big insurance companies, banks, manufacturers, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, they're nice. They string you along. They don't want to say, Greg, we're never going to buy that. Get out, <laughs> right? Sure, call me in a couple of weeks. Sure, let's go for lunch and kick it around, right? And so they string you along and you waste a ton of time on something that's never going to happen. Yeah. Or I think, um, and I agree, and I think what's happening more and more at the moment is uh, we've, all, we've always had the shortlisting, but I think we're getting more and more that where it's like, oh, here's the product or a couple of products I'm interested in, but throw in add in these other companies too, just so we can just compare pricing or something. And then you think you're in a sales cycle when all you've really been doing is just being used to compare or just to, you know, have more people in, in the mix. But you should be able to tell that from your interactions. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings me to my last, and maybe maybe it was the most important one. Um, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, is the, you know, the failure to plan. Yeah. Um, sellers love just jumping in and as I like to say, letting the fur fly, right? Let's see how it goes. Let's see what they do. Um, let's see what, what we can find. Mm -hmm. And and I find there's four critical areas that planning really pays off in selling. One is around prospecting. We talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. having a message that is targeted to the person you're reaching out to. So that resonates, it's compelling and they go, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, maybe I should have a conversation with this person. Um, Second area is in call planning, something I'm sure, John, you're really very familiar with. Um, A lot of calls, let's just get in there, ask a few questions, see where it goes. No, we need, you know, have a high level plan. And for many of us, if it's a critical call, a really detailed plan. What are we going to ask? What are we going to present on? What are we going to close on? Right? Yeah. Third area is on um, opportunity planning or deal uh, deal planning. Where are we in the deal? Um, where are our risks? 
Um, what should we be doing to mitigate those? Right. And what do we need to do now? And what can we do later? Mm -hmm. and, and the last one that's really critical. Sorry if I no no go ahead. there. Go ahead. Is um, pipeline. Yeah. Planning. A lot of people think pipeline planning is, is all about forecasting, and it can be. But the most important value to pipeline planning is it tells you where to spend your time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, should I be spending time on prospecting or on this deal that's about to close or this mm -hmm. other one that's been, you know, sitting around for a while? Where do I spend my time? And by analyzing your overall pipeline of opportunities, looking at the stages they're in, come and then calendarizing your activities, um, that's how you're much much more likely to make your numbers than yeah. just uh, responding to the the urgent but not necessarily important stuff. Yeah, and I think what you just said there, um, you know, Greg, about uh, calendarizing things, because there's always a great in, an interesting one is if you look at most salespeople's calendars, yeah, you will see all the appointments, absolutely, you know, the calls and the appointments. But then if you ask them to say, where's the prep time for this call? Mm. And you go, oh, well, you know, I'll do, I'll, I'll do it before the call. We say, yeah, but you haven't blocked off time for it, so are you really going to do it? Or are you going to five minutes before, like review your notes? But I, I think that's a really important one. I think the planning, um, it's more critical than ever, but it requires that you do, you know, you put in the hard yards before you ever make, before you ever attend the call. Yeah. I, I describe a process that I recommend people do on every Friday afternoon before they go home. You sit down, you have a look at your opportunities. You figure out what have I got to do first? What have I got to do second? What have I got to do third? calendarize it and you come in monday morning you're ready to roll yeah yeah that's a great piece of advice well this has been this has been fascinating greg five great uh, uh five great mistakes to highlight that uh, people can look at uh, very practical and can immediately start addressing if you recognize any of those or are things that you're falling prey to and let's face it um greg it doesn't matter how long all of us are in business and stuff we often forget the fundamentals because then we just get all caught up on how experienced we are that we forget to do some of the fundamentals so it's always a good reminder yep absolutely yeah. absolutely all right well listen thanks again greg all of greg's information is going to be below this video but before we go greg please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business sure appreciate it john so i've been uh in sales consulting sales and channel consulting for uh over 30 years i hate to admit it I worked with some very large companies like Microsoft and SAP and Hewlett Packard and some very small startups uh, all around helping companies scale their sales capabilities. If you'd like to know more about my new book, uh, on, you can check it out on Amazon or you can go to www.p3selling.com or check out the P3 Selling uh, web uh, page, uh, company page on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely and we will encourage and the book we will have the book uh, below this video as well um so don't forget p3 selling the essentials of b2b sales success so listen thanks again greg thank you for watching and listening and i will see you all again soon thank you thanks john